We're here today to chat about uh, waiting for the retrieval team and looking after the critically ill child under those circumstances. Um, and I've been asked to talk about uh, securing the airway. And in general, that means intubation. But in, I think we have to always step, take a step back and hold on, how do we go? And remember that intubation isn't everything. The key is keeping the kid alive. And we're intubating to, so, so you may have to step back and think, right, is intubation the best thing? Am I the best person to do it? And those are the thoughts that should be running through your head at the beginning. And just always remembering that intubation isn't everything and don't get focused on that at the expense of the child. So why do we intubate them? We're looking, we, we come down and the child needs supported. It's not, it's struggling with breathing. It needs, it's increased work of breathing. It's tiring, or even sometimes just that it needs uh, help with the circulation. And the only way of securing the, the necessary lines is to uh, look after the airway first. Um, so that's really what I was saying at the beginning. Don't get into problems if you don't have to. So your initial considerations when you're looking at the child, this is, it's like looking after any child. How sick is this child? Have I got time to, to sort myself out? Will I have time during the intubation process? Are we struggling to keep the SATs up? So therefore, are we gonna have, to, um, each time I go to intubate, am I gonna have a few seconds or am I gonna have 30 seconds? And 30 seconds is a long time when you're doing this. Then the age of the child. It's, uh, it's always interesting working. I'm, uh, my background is anesthetics going into um, intensive care medicine, uh, pediatric intensive care. Um, and so, uh, and whenever you have uh, junior anaesthetists working with you or people from an anesthetic background, generally they, they want the, the older child as the one that they're more comfortable with. And if you're working with pediatricians, um, especially here where they the tend to be a bit heavy in the neonatal uh, work in their, in their training, they, they want a child that's tiny and has no teeth. So it's, it, it varies with who you are as to which child you feel more comfortable with. But that's really important. You look at the child and, and, and have a think about uh, what the shape of the child is. And uh, one of the, the things I'll come to later on is just the size of the head and re relative to the, to the child. Um, because positioning can be a massive amount of, of, of how you, whether you can work this, get the intubation done quickly or not. And is there help available? Um, mostly here, that means calling anesthetics to give you a hand. Um, and then preparing your equipment, making sure that whatever you're going to need is, is at hand and you're supporting the baby during that preparation or the child. So head size is, is, um, is really important. This one just looks at, at a baby, but the, the key here is, uh, the, key here is the, the size of the occiput and the size of the face. And the, the face in the baby is a small part of its head. It's one of the reasons they're so cute. They have a big head and a wee cute face. And, Everybody goes, ooh. And so, so that's important. As you get older, your face becomes a bigger part of your, your body. The head, oh, so dear, didn't mean to do that. The, um, the occiput becomes relatively smaller. So as an adult, when you're intubating an adult, you need to put something in behind their head in general. Because always you're looking for the position of flexed neck, extended head, sniffing the morning air in theory. But I don't know that anybody's ever sniffed the morning air in that position, because I think it's a bit awkward. But, that's the position you're looking for. And in a, in, a, in a child with a sort of standard child-sized head, like a sort of two to five-year-old, their head is just about the right size to do that for itself. It's a fairly big head. It puts in a slight flex. And if all you do is extend the neck when it's lying down, you're in the right position. The tiny babies, especially the premies, their head is just massive. And you actually need to raise the body up a bit to do that. So sometimes it's put a, a towel in behind. And the other thing, even, even better sometimes, if you, have your, if you have somebody who knows what they're doing with you, um, they can put their hand in behind the, the, the baby's chest and actually raise it up and down as you need. So if you've got a spare person who's, who's trained in, in what you're doing, that, that can be really, really useful. Um, but as I say, you don't, a, a towel in behind can just get you into the right position. And the other thing is you see, even when you're doing the, the, um, the bagging, or using a mask on the child. If the child's sitting flat and the head flexed forward like that, the tongue comes back 
and makes your life much more difficult. You have to get a lot of extension, a lot of jaw thrust. If you get the position right down here, the tongue doesn't fall back as much and you'll find it's much easier to get the airway. Hang on, I have water. A bit of water. Um, so babies have a much larger tongue and it gradually changes as they get older. The, the larynx, everybody talks about them having an, an anterior larynx. Anatomically, what they have is, is a higher larynx. Their larynx sits about C4, uh, whereas in adults with C6. And, and that is, uh, so it's, it's, it's more, um, it's really higher up the, the, uh, the neck rather than anterior, but it's, it just changes the axis of everything as you're looking in. And so it appears to be more anterior and, and up out of your way in a different way. Children are, are obligate nose breathers until five months, and that um, sounds as if it, it, uh, it and the, the interesting thing about that is that kids also are very, um, they also are, have a great tendency to get a, a cold and block their nose. And so the small five month child with a chest infection and a cold can be a real difficulty to, to bag because you, you saw the shape of the head, you, they block their nose, it's, their, it's the, the clearest airway that they have. And yet we end up with a position that, that, that that's the reason that you've been called is because generally they've got a, a respiratory tract infection of some sort and often that blocks their nose. The epiglottis, as we all know, is, is U-shaped rather than flat, then flat, uh, it, as, you, as they get older. So it, it can hang in your way and we'll, we'll have a look at that in a second or two as well. And they, we were always taught whenever a long, long time ago when I was coming through that was we were, I were taught that they're uh, narrower at the cricoid. In reality, more recent work with uh, MRIs and stuff has shown that the that actually it's a function it's a functional narrowing because the cricoid is the is the last bit that doesn't stretch the uh, larynx is, um, is is more move is more adjustable and elastic and so the the cricoid is actually not the narrowest place but it's the narrowest it's the bit that you can't stretch so it acts as the narrowest place so just on a pedantic point which my colleagues will know that I love. So, and this is just looking at, at the different types of uh, laryngoscope that you can have. Um, with the anterior floppy uh, larynx, am I, is this the right, it is the right one, yes. So, that, so that's a Mac 3 blade, okay, with a curve on it. And the, the, um, that's the classic way that, that anybody who's trained in adults intubation, that's the classic blade that they will use or be comfortable with. And the idea of that bit, it goes in uh, just over the, the epiglottis there and it lifts it forward. The, the long, this is a Miller blade and it's a long straight blade. And the idea of that is you, get, you lift the epiglottis up out of the way. And classically, that's a, lifting the epiglottis up out of the way is a better way to deal with small children because they have a big U-shaped floppy epiglottis that gets in the way. And the, whereas the, the Miller or the Mac blade uh, assumes that the the attachment between the back of the pharynx and the epiglottis is quite stiff and you can lift it up out of the way. <laughs> so what I would all, what I was to say to, to a lot of the people who are coming through the, our junior registrars uh, or the registrars in anesthetics, when they're coming through, they love a Mac 2 blade. And what I tend to tell them about children is that with a, with a child that's going to be fairly easy to intubate, a Mac 2 blade makes it even easier for you. They, it works very well in the kids that are easier to intubate. The Miller blade is slightly more awkward. It's, it's a bit narrower. It's a bit more difficult to deal with the tongue. But a Miller blade, in, in general, I think makes a, 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 an easy intubation slightly more difficult, but it makes a difficult intubation possible. And my general opinion with small babies is you should basically always use the Miller blade because it's at the time when you need to use it, you should have practiced with it lots. And so you should just generally use it to be comfortable with it so that in the difficult intubation where you're actually going to need a straight blade, you're going to have to lift the epiglottis out, up out of the way. You've got a very anterior, as I said, higher larynx. Um, that's when you really need the, to, to be uh, comfortable with the straight blade. And so, so generally we, we recommend that you use it most of the time, although I don't know that anybody ever listens to me. I've seen a lot of Mac 2 blades around. So. Sorry. Um, in keeping with any um, intubation reading for a, a, a retrieval team, I was in a bit of a rush here because the, the traffic was grim and uh, you, run in, you run in and that's exactly how you always are when you're, you've been asked to intubate a, 
a sick child, you can be running in with your own heart rate going faster than theirs. So looking at the, the physiology involved, um, the children have a higher uh, oxygen consumption uh, relatively. And the, the, the thing that matters about that is just that they tend to drop their SATs. Uh, sick children tend to drop their SATs very quickly. So don't get obsessed with intubating. You should be obsessed with keeping the child alive. And you may only have a few seconds each time you try. So if you haven't got your positioning right the first time you look in and all you can see is the back of the pharynx or all you can see is epiglottis, but you've been able to bag them previously, well then just back out bag them again, have a look, is there something I can do about, uh, in, uh, about changing the position, and go back in again. Don't just keep trying to intubate at the expense of the child. They've got uh, re reduced functional residual capacity, and that again has, it basically has the same effect. It's very easy for them to, uh, to lose volume in, in their lungs, and so every time that you go back in, after they've suddenly desaturated them, and sitting it in the mid-90s, and you have a go at intubating, and you look up and they're 60, when you go back in, you may actually have to spend a bit of time giving a little bit of pressure to, uh, to allow the, the lungs to, to fill up it again and get back into a reasonable saturation. And if you do that, you may blow air into the stomach, and so you may in, uh, at times have to even put in an NG tube just to get the, the stomach decom uh, decompressed. Um, the other thing, just the, the, you may all know that the, 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 the the resistance to flow in the airways is the, the fourth power in the radius. So, you, so the, the smaller children, it's just h higher resistance to get air in and out of them in comparison to bagging a big child or an adult. Um, and th and that, that also means that a lot of the children that you're dealing with will have uh, infection and inflammation in their chest. And so the, the, a small amount of, of inflammation is classic of bronchiolitis. is why they, the small children collapse with bronchiolitis with the same amount of inflammation in the lungs as an adult gets a bit of a cough. And it's, it's the same deal, but the, the key for the, what we're talking about here is that it just reduces the time. And just remember that and come back up and uh, bag rather than, uh, rather than just obsess about intubating. So get your history. Can the child speak or breathe or are they noisy? Uh, are there any syndromes? Uh, Pierre Robin, I'm not sure if that's how you spell it, hurlers. Uh, neck movement, tongue size, and overall, a difficult intubation is about 1% to 2%. The smaller you are, it's slightly more than that. Bag mask is, is the most important thing, as we said about. Head position, then. Um, I'm talking here both, both about the head position of the, of the patient, which we chatted about earlier there, but also the head, your own head position. Um, I, always, uh, I would say there's, jokingly said, there are two reasons why you should, as you see here, when this person, if you can see where the, they're looking in at, the, at, the, at the, the mouth and you can see the larynx at the back, if you can imagine the camera being where your head is, um, if this plinth is where, where your head is, you should be back off the child. A lot of people, because they're nervous and, and intubating, um, there's a tendency to stick your head right down into the, in, into the patient's mouth. And it doesn't get you any better view. And more importantly, it doesn't... Uh, allow you to see out of the peripheries. So what you want to do is be able to lift the uh, 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 jaw forward, can see what you're doing, and hold your hand up here without taking your, your eyes off what you're doing. And with you, out of the your peripheral vision, you can see somebody putting the tube into your hand, your assistant putting the tube into your hand, and you can maintain your, your position the whole time and do that. Because there's a tendency to stick in, think, oh, I've got a view, and then you have to go over here grab the tube, and by the time you look back, you've lost your view again, and whether you can get it back in time is difficult. So the other reason for doing that is because it, it just looks deeply uncool if your face is right here in the child. <laughs> and in the middle of all of this, you have to pretend that you know what you're doing, and you have to look as if you know what you're doing. And one of those things is just standing back off it, and it doesn't make any difference to the amount of your view, but it looks a lot better. So. As you see here, one of the other things that we, we always get um, uh, is, is to pull. Now, I would say that this is pulling slightly too much laterally, and I like to, I like to pull this direction with the mouth. But if you can get your assistant to, to uh, don't actually have to hook into the lip is there. You get, that's because that's a dummy, and, and the tissues are very stiff in it. But all you really need is get somebody to do that. And it makes a, a big difference to two things. One, to your initial view, but more importantly, to how far across, we'll come to in a second, 
you actually want to bring the tube in from the side of the mouth. Don't bring the tube in down the, 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 the line of the laryngoscope because that just blocks your view. And the number, again, one of the problems people have is they, they do, especially with the Miller blade with its, with its sort of C-shaped um, aperture, with the, they have it in the middle or over to the right of the mouth. And the only place you can really put the tube then is they get a good view, but they're, they put the tube down the view and then you can't see what you're doing. And then they intubate the esophagus and wonder why. So if you, if you watch somebody who's done a lot, they tend to get the, the blade in, they move the blade over to the left, and we'll show that in a minute, and actually come in from this side with the tube. And a, a, a help for that is to get somebody just to lift the, lift the lip up out of the way. And so you're coming in and you can see what you're doing the whole way and it doesn't block your own view. So this is the position you should end up with. Your head well back from the, from the, the child, the, I uh, haven't got anybody holding the lip there at the moment, but you come in from, from that angle so that you can see what you're doing and not down the, the, the level of the blade blocking your own view. Um, there are various ways of gripping a laryngoscope. The classic way we're taught, particularly in the adult land, is to hold a laryngoscope like this, and that is perfectly adequate with an adult. For two reasons, we tend to hold them more like this as, as uh, in children. And the, the first of those is just the feel getting, you, you're, you do not need the same amount of, of um, pressure that you might need in, a, in an adult with old stiff, um, stiff jaws and stiff muscles. So you do not need to be lifting. If you're using that amount of force with a baby, you lift the baby up off the ground and you're doing it wrong. You have to imagine that the, the, the amount of force you use in a child is much smaller. As you can see, you use, it's more like a pen grip that we tend to recommend here, and uh, it, it's like this. And there, there's, there's two reasons for that, and I'll show in the intubation course at lunch, I'll show you the, the, the uh, next step from this. But the next step from that is that once you have the, the, the laryngoscope in and in position, you can actually let go with all but the, these two fingers. And that allows you to stretch your hand out, and you can do your own cricoid pressure with your finger. The uh, people who do a lot of neonates have done, uh, tend to do, or you can reach the, generally in a neonate, you can reach while still holding like that, you can reach with your little finger. In a bigger child, you have to spread your hand a little bit more. Um, but, and the, 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 as I say, I'll show you anything, but basically you can end up with the, the laryngoscope sitting like that, and you're just holding it with these two fingers, and your little finger is able to do cricoid pressure. And it's a massive advantage to be able to do your own cricoid pressure. It, because generally the person doing the cricoid pressure with the best will in the world pushes it in the wrong direction you, the, and it's very hard to explain to them what, where exactly you want them to push it. So if you can do your own cricoid pressure it'll get you out of a lot of problems and, and it happens to, it's particularly useful with babies and people say oh my hand's not big enough and it, it, it just that's not correct because I don't have big hands and you don't you the stretch is not that is not that much and so I'll show you, as I say, at lunchtime, if anybody wants to, to see. But in essence, what you're doing is you start off with a pen grip, and then after you're in position, you can let go with everything except these two fingers and use your little finger for, for cricoid pressure. And if you, if you can learn that, it'll get you out of a lot of holes. Uh, again, some standard stuff about intubation. Uh, lift forward, do not, do not lever. Um, Obviously, the bigger kids with teeth, you'll actually chip their teeth or break their teeth off. Um, we had a, a colleague once who, uh, many, many years ago, 20 years ago, and this was in, in adult land, uh, had a colleague who um, appeared from, uh, as, uh, as a fellow and uh, was intubating the first child. And we had a, a very nervous uh, consultant that um, we all we used to talk about whether how hot the sand was that day because the more nervous she got, the more she skipped about, as if the, the, the ground was too hot to stand on. And she came running out of her, out of her uh, room one day. She'd been wor the first day she was working with this registrar. And she came running out uh, just as her feet barely touching the ground. And I asked the, the nurses wh who, what had happened. And the, the registrar had put the laryngoscope in and couldn't really get a decent view, and she just snapped off the two front teeth, and then without a bat, no, without batting an eyelid, just went okay, and then intubated, <laughs> and started bagging the patient. And your woman's going, "My God, my God, Lizzie!" 
and it didn't, didn't mind at all. So it is possible to actually break the teeth off. Most people don't do it deliberately. That girl's no longer in medicine, but it's, <laughs> it, was, it was a difficult time for all of us. Um, I was the most uh, junior anaesthetist in the building at the time, and I rapidly became quite senior because uh, the, the, everything was, was about stopping her breaking off people's front teeth from the, for the next year. So if your view is poor, um, remember that even in a baby, the, 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 uh, even if they don't have any teeth, you can damage the gums and the teeth coming through. So the fact that there aren't any teeth doesn't mean that levering is okay. All right. Uh, if the, the poor view is, it, it's often not the child's fault that there's a poor view. It's, unless there's some specific anatomical reason, it's generally your fault. So come back out, have a look, bag up, and while you're bagging up, try and work out what it is about your positioning that is not allowing you to have a view. And, and can you maybe do that thing, as I said, with, the, with your little finger? Um, the, this picture just is a bit gross looking at this time of the morning, but that, that's the tongue. And the, the, the key with that is the tongue, when positioned right with the ring scope, is over to the left-hand side. You use, go down the right-hand side of the ring scope, push it over. Everybody knows that, but it's remarkable how few people actually do it when they're going to intubate and generally they're trying to squash the tongue up against the roof of the mouth and it just reduces the amount of view that you have. So go down the right and push it over to the left and if you've, you're having difficulty having a view, actually have a look and have you got the tongue out of the way? And it'll be remarkable how often the tongue is actually not out of the way. Oh, wrong way. Just worked out how this works. Um, and that's what we're saying, that's a closer view of, the, of, of just getting the angles correct and, and giving yourself a, a view at the side and coming in at the side, don't go down the blade of the laryngoscope. So we're coming near the end of this, this is one of the, we, we often put uh, um, intubate using or through the nose um, in intensive care, that's one of, our, one of the places we like to put the, the tube for reasons we all know, which are that it's, it's easier to secure the tube. <coughs> Um, it's the, uh, when they're waking up, they don't chew on it. They, there's a more of a, they avoid the gag reflex as much. And so when you're waking the child up later on, it's all right. Uh, in theater, often we just, we just use a, uh, an oral intubation because they, uh, it's just, um, you don't need to, you don't need to have to keep the child uh, asleep as long. But the key for, for while everybody, while you know that we want a, a nasal tube, from the, the ICU point of view, don't think that you absolutely have to do it from the, from the point of view of the, of the team waiting for the retrieval hospital. Mm -hmm. If you want to and you're comfortable with it, that's fine. But uh, an oral tube is very acceptable for the, for the retrieval team coming in. One of the things that, that what we're showing here is that it, with the suction catheter down the tube, and the reason I'm mentioning that just from a nasal intubation point of view is whenever you put a, a nasal tube into an adult, it's fine. You just put it down a huge nose and, and uh, it, it goes in, uh, it goes around the corner of the back and that's fine. Uh, when you do it with a baby, you have to remember that there are adenoids at the back and, and it's quite easy to core out the adenoids and, and, and actually stick the tube through the adenoids if, you, if you're unlucky enough. And that can cause an, a lot of bleeding and that just suddenly, what was a reasonably easy intubation suddenly turns into a total shambles. So. We, one of the ways around that is to use a, a suction catheter or you can use a, a very fine um, uh, um, bougie um, or a, a, what do you call the thing, a tube changer. And if you just slip it down the, the nose itself, get it round the corner first and then railroad the tube over it, it'll not dig into the, the adenoids as much. Um, and uh, we... Um, the other thing to do, especially with the, the bougie, is to bend the tip of it. The bougies and the, and the um, tube changers are pretty straight at the end, but if you, actually, if you just bend the plastic before you, before you put it down and have the bend going uh, forward so that as it goes down the nose, it comes around the corner more easily, you'll, you'll get away with a lot less bleeding and it'll make your life a lot easier. In general, in, in PIC and Royal, we, um, to, uh, we, we do the oral intubation first, and then you get somebody to hold the tube over to the left-hand side of the mouth, and then you do the, the, put the, the nasal tube down and uh, intubate from there um, so, that, and so that you're absolutely ready and you've got the tube pointing at the larynx before the person takes the, the uh, ET tube out. So the time involved is, is, is as small as possible. Um, 
the the difficulty with that as 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 anybody who's done it in a small baby will know, is just that you have a small mouth and you have a lot of stuff in the mouth at that point and there's just a, a, a bit of a lack of room. And one of the things to remember both with that, uh, with the uh, oral intubation and with the nasal intubation, is that the larynx sits at a slightly, uh, it, it doesn't sit f um, full on to the, or at 90 degrees to the, uh, to the uh, trachea, it's at an angle. And if you go through the larynx, uh, the way the tube comes through from the back of the nose, it comes through up, up like this. And if you just try and put it through at that angle, in a baby it'll bounce off the back of the uh, trachea and, and won't advance. In an adult it tends to advance because there's a lot more room. The trachea is quite massive compared comparatively in the tube because the, the, di the diameter of the, of the lumen is big compared with the wall diameter. It tends to bend around and go down itself and in bigger children that happens. In a, in a baby, you may have to bend the tube itself and push it down, put it, point it downwards as it's going through the larynx to get it to go down through at the right angle. It is not uncommon for us to get a message that the, 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 tube, the larynx is easy to see, but they can't get the tube to go through it. And, and when they eventually get up to us, all we have to do is, is point the tube in a slightly different direction, i.e. downwards uh, at about that angle, that angle. And uh, the tube will just slip on through, okay? So those are the main, that's the main bit of this morning, um, to talking about intubation, and I'll, I'll be available at lunchtime to, to chat about any of it with you, that, uh, as, if anybody's interested. Thank you very much.